Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, it was a last minute decision to actually come. I wasn't sure just a few days ago whether I would be here or not, but I'm happy to be here now. Um, so I will be uh, given a series of lectures about various topics related to minimal energy packing and covering. And uh, today's lecture is going to be very introductory. And I was thinking about this as a winter school. You usually think about the winter school um, as something for students, beginning students. Uh, and actually for today, I'm quite embarrassed looking at the list of uh, participants uh, on Zoom. Uh, what I will talk about uh, today will be quite elementary, quite easy. So most of you probably know this, but hopefully I will say some things that are uh, uh, that will be interesting. And also I will definitely adapt it a little bit to the audience for future life lectures. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, since the program is about optimal point configurations on manifolds, I think it's fitting that the first lecture is about points on the sphere, the minimal energy second covering on the sphere. And today, just to announce, most I will talk about uh, results about a small. Okay, so uh, when we talk about points on spheres, um, there are various ways to measure, quantify, or to express what it means that you have a good distribution of points on the sphere. So you could have some sort of structured sets, uh, po uh, regular polytopes or nice poly uh, polytopes, some other structures like shortest vectors of lattices or equiangular lines, frames, and so on. Uh, you could... Uh, look at minimal energy points, uh, you could look at um, optimal coverings and packings, you can look at discrepancy, or you can, you can look at uh, random points, you can, uh, for example, IID, completely random points, you could look at points, some other random processes, such as uh, jittered sampling or determinantal point processes, you could also uh, look at equidistribution and discrepancy uh, and, and so on. So there are lots of different uh, uh, interpretations of what it means to have a good, uh, a good point distribution. Yeah, and many of them are very closely related to each other. And of course, uh, in this uh, series of lectures, we will mostly talk about the energy minimization and optimal covering, coverings and pack, uh, packings. But of, of course, they will be closely related to many other topics, including certain structured sets, distribution and discrepancy. We will also talk about frames, equiangular uh, lines, and so on. All right, so, uh, but let's start right away with the definitions. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, uh, we will be on the unit sphere in, uh, and notice that D here is the dimension of the sphere. Uh, the ambient dimension is D plus one. In general, you could give these definitions in an arbitrary, say compact metric space. Okay, so if you have some kernel K, and right now I'm not imposing any conditions on it, you can consider the discrete energy generated by a set, a finite set of points. So it's just this sum. And for now, we will exclude the diagonal terms here because very often in, in, in most uh, natural examples, Okay, not most, but a lot of natural examples. Um, the kernel is uh, singular when singular on the diagonal when when the points are the same here. Right. So we'll so we will take the sum of all pairwise interactions. So this is exactly the type of interaction. This was the first term in the energy functional that Tama wrote uh, wrote down. Okay, so in the mo many natural situations, your uh, potential function here, the kernel, will depend just on the distance or just on the relative position of the two points. Okay, and on the sphere, very often it's more convenient to express it in terms of the inner product rather than the distance. Although uh, today I will mostly talk about the distance. And of course, if whenever you talk about energies like this, the first example that always comes up is the electrostatic energy, the Thompson problem. So that asks um, about uh, what about the optimal point configuration, which minimizes 
this energy. Um, and it seems like a very simple and naive question, but the answers are known only for a handful of values of n. So it's only, only very few exact answers are known. And in particular, the case n equal to five here is particularly interesting because the answer has only been found a few years ago, and it's a computer-assisted proof. Um, all right, um, well, you can generalize this and you can consider it. So this was Peter Thompson's problem is on S2 and with power one. So this is really, this is the electrostatic potential coming from, the, from Coulomb's law. Um, you can generalize it to other Reese energies, so other potentials with power S here. And in the case S equal to zero, if you really put power zero here, that becomes uninteresting, but the proper analog is replacing this with the logarithm. Okay. And um, again, when S is the dimension of the sphere minus one, that's the analog of Thompson's problem. That's the new Newtonian Coulomb or Newtonian potential. When you consider the log that's known as the the minimal energy points, uh, finding min minimal energy points is known as Smale's problem, and uh, these are so-called logarithmic or Fekete points, or also you can look at uh, look at this as maximizing the product of pairwise distances, um, if, if you rewrite this expression. And again, the answer is known for the same handful of um, values of n. Okay, and uh, it's also it also makes sense to consider negative values of s here. Okay, only in that case, you either need to put a minus in front of this expression, or you need to say that you're maximizing. Now, in particular, when s is equal to negative one, this is the sum of distances. So this problem is maximize the sum of distances between the points. And uh, you could define Reese energies on other manifolds, on metric spaces with different uh, notions of distance, and those problems would all make sense. So many of them would be very interesting still. Okay, so let's... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, may I, may I ask a question? So even the n equals seven still open? Uh, sorry? Even n equals seven still open? I think for the energy it is, as far as I know. For a packing, it's it's not. For the packing, more is known, but I th I think for the energy it is. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's okay. Cool, cool. Right. Yeah, thank for, you. For for packing, we'll get to packing in a moment. More is known for the optimal packing. Yeah. Well, remark. Uh, the slides also are cut off. I know. Unfortunately, I cannot do the same yeah. thing as someone did. I'll try. Yeah. So what's cut off here is says that. Uh, yeah, but on Zoom, you can see it. So Sorry. you can't see it here, but you can see it. Oh, you can see it on the screen. Okay. okay. In, in Zoom. Okay, great. Yeah. But it says that uh, for the fair dot problem on the sum of distances, uh, the answer is known for the same uh, values of n as for, say, the Thompson problem. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things that are known. Um, so, in particular, one case which is completely solved is the case uh, of d equal to one. So the S1, just the unit circle. And in this case, you have uh, this interesting dichotomy that, well, it's sort of clear what, would ha what should happen in the interesting case, okay, because you are on S1, if you expect the points to be uniformly distributed, well, that should be the roots of units, right? They just take points equally spaced on the unit circle. Okay, and that happens in this range. So basically for all positive S for the log, so that's the analog of S equal to zero. And uh, in the range, in the negative range between zero and negative two. Okay, so here is, you have a phase transition at negative two. Now, uh, on the other side of negative two, you have an interesting phenomenon. If n is even, um, you have this picture where you have n over two points here and n over two points at the opposite pole. And those are the only uh, minimizers or max maximizers in this case. Okay. 
And at the phase transition at S equal to negative two, when you're considering the sum of squares of distances, you have um, that any configuration with center of mass at zero is a minimizer or maximizer in this case. Okay, we'll see a computation on the next slide, which proves that it's very easy to prove. It's one line, essentially. But I would like to point out that this is a very interesting phenomenon, which I will talk about more either in the third or in the fourth lecture. Actually, if you look at the two statements here, actually, I just realized that my picture below is not very good because it's not an S1. It's an S2, but the, this, these two statements are actually true in all dimensions. And uh, the first statement is also sort of true in, in all dimensions in the following sense, that uh, when N becomes large, uh, points, uh, energy minimizers will be uniformly distributed. Okay. So, um, so you have this phase transition at all dimensions with an interesting fact that the phase transition, the value of the phase transition is independent of the dimension. Okay, it's always negative two. However, it does depend on the structure of your metric because there is an interesting fact that if you consider the Reese energy on the sphere with uh, the geodesic distance, so if you replace Euclidean, distance by geodesic distance, then the critical value of S, the phase transition is is at S equal to one, uh, negative one, not negative two. And uh, yeah, and I'll talk about this phenomenon uh, later, but it seems that it should be happening for all compact metric spaces, although I don't have a proof for that. I think it's an interesting problem, first of all, to show that this happens, this sort of phenomenon happens at all for all metric spaces, and also to understand how the phase transition depends on the structure of that metric space. Well, and by saying this phenomenon, I don't mean that you would necessarily be getting two points, but you will be getting this clustering phenomenon uh, where uh, when the, yeah. Foundation. Well, okay, so you have the so you have one type of behavior for S. So essentially this first case is S greater than negative two. We have one type of behavior. Your minimizers are uniformly distributed. Optim optimal energy points are uniformly distributed. And uh, on the other uh, the other part of the a set of parameters, you have the opposite behavior. Your minimizers are not uniform, or optimizers are not uniformly distributed, they cluster. Okay, so you have n over two points clustered here and n over two points clustered here. Okay, and in between, you have a whole slew of different optimizers, right? You have optimized so avoid point configurations which have this property, it could be anything you want, it could be like this, or they could be very uniformly distributed. We have this clustering phenomenon that happens essentially when, so what's going on here is that uh, the repulsion is becomes weak, okay? And uh, it's true that the repulsion plays a very important role here, but also if you look at the geodesic distance and the Euclidean distance at small scales, they behave very similarly. But for the geodesic distance, this phase transition happens at S equal to negative one, which says that probably it's not just the repulsion that plays a role here. So there is more structural information that, that that's important. And later in the lectures, I will probably even prove some of these results. All right. Um, okay, so I think this is a very interesting phenomenon, which, um, it's already interesting even in one dimension, but uh, happens also in higher dimensions uh, and the phase transition, at least on the sphere for the geodesic and Euclidean distances independent of the dimension. The phase transition between two, two different types of behavior 
uniform minimizers and uniformly distributed minimizers and clustered minimizers. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, let's move on. So I'll talk about this phenomenon more in one of the future lectures this week. Okay, uh, so, but now let's talk about uh, some of the uh, cases when the number of points is relatively small and the number of cases in which we can say something about the minimizers. And in particular, uh, we will, there is the following statement. If the number of points is less than the dimension plus two, that's ambient dimension plus one. Okay, and if your kernel depends on distance squared, through a decreasing and convex function f, okay, then the energy, the corresponding uh, energy with this kernel will be min minimized by vertices of a regular simplex of the corresponding dimension. Okay. Okay. And this is very, very easy to prove, and I have essentially written down the proof here. So first, if we just compute this energy, the, the sum of squares of distances, well, you use the law of cosines, and then you notice that this thing here is just the norm squared of the sum of your vectors. So this here is greater than or equal to 2n squared. Okay, and by the way, this proves the phase transition from the previous slide. It proves what happens at when the power is equal in the Riesz energy, the power is equal to negative 2. It's... Uh, well, this is minimized or sorry, maximized in this case, we're maximizing when the center of mass at the origin where the sum of the vectors is zero. All right, but then uh, you, use, uh, you use the structure of your function f. First, you use Jensen's inequality. Okay. And so you have taken the average of f is greater than or equal than the f of the average. And here you can throw in the diagonal terms for free. And then you use this inequality using the fact that f is decreasing. And that's it. And now you know when the equality happens. Well, first of all, you need all of these distances to be the same. Okay. And second, for this equality to happen, here you need um, the sum of the vectors to be zero. Okay, well, that defines a simplex. Okay, so that's so this is a very easy statement, but it will be very useful in the future that uh, we have a certain universal universality problem uh, property here that this simplex minimizes the energy for all kernels of this type. In particular, it minimizes uh, the energy for all Riesz energies with. Uh, say was with positive s. For now, I'll just need positive s. So this is a, this. Uh, so you have the same minimizer independently of s. Okay. All right. So uh, it will. Uh, we can now take s to infinity. Okay. And when you take s to infinity, okay. If you go back to the original definition of the Riesz energy, well, this you can view this as the Ls norm to the power. S, right? Okay, well, the limit of the LS norms when S goes to infinity is the L infinity norm. So you would take the maximum of these terms. So, well, essentially you're looking for the minimal distance. Okay, so, and that's exactly the packing problem. So, in the case of the sphere, this is known as Tam's problem. Tam's was a botanist. He um, he studied the distribution of, of pores and pollen grains, and he asked, uh, "When can we, uh, for which values of n, can we find optimal um, optimal packings or op uh, the uh, sets which?" maximize the min minimal separation distance. Okay. And again, here only a handful of answers are known, but here, well, I think the word handful is not good anymore because it's more than 10. So you already you would need to use at least one foot. Okay. So um, so there are, there are a few more values of, uh, of n for which best packings are known. But let me, for 
a couple slides talk about packing and covering problems in a little bit more detail. So now let's uh, let's just introduce some definitions. We will be on an arbitrary compact metric space. Okay, and well, let's also assume that it's infinite because if it's finite, it's not as interesting. Although, although there are there are still interesting uh, interesting questions even on finite metric spaces. Um, okay, so given a set of endpoints, call it Z n. So we'll look at the minimal distance between distinct points from this set. And that's called the separation distance. So uh, essentially, you can view it by this called packing. You you can view it as uh, what is the minimal, what is the radius of the disks? Sorry, what is the maximal radius of the disk which you can put? So that those disks do not overlap. So this is this is the disk or ball or sphere packing. Okay. So you're you're trying to pack, and this this will be the radius that you can uh, put will be one half of of the separation distance. Okay. So you can if you know the separation distance, distance you can pack spheres of radius one half that, that separation distance. Okay, and then you're interested in understanding what's the best separation that you can achieve. What's the largest largest separation distance that you can achieve using endpoints in a given set? Okay, so what's the um, uh, what's the largest separation? Okay, so this this will be then I will denote this by delta n. And it's closely related to Reese energy. So this first fact I already explained as S goes to infinity, the one over S powers of the minimal Reese energy uh, approaches one over lambda, uh, over omega, sorry, over delta N. Sorry, I'm jet lagged, I arrived, uh, arrived just a couple hours ago. Okay, and there is, one more connection to the energy, uh, to the Reese energies. Um, the optimal separation distance uh, can be bounded below by the uh, opt optimal, uh, the separation distance of the optimal energy points. And this could be estimated through the optimal energy like this. Okay, I will not prove this fact. It's not too hard to prove uh, it's a direct computation with induction. Okay. So using, uh, you can translate back and forth some information between optimal energy points and optimal, and optimal separation or the best packing. Okay. Um, well, closely related to, uh, to packing is the best covering. Okay. And uh, for a given, set of endpoints Zn, you define the covering radius like this. So you look, you take a point X in your set and you find the closest point in the closest point in your point distribution. Okay, and then you take the supremum over all X. So basically this asks, what's the radius of the spheres that you need to take so that your whole set omega is covered? That's that's why it's called um, it's called a covering and yeah and here is the picture that explains the difference between the covering and the packing. So here this is the packing. This is the covering. And again, you're asking the same question. Uh, you're uh, only here. Uh, it's a uh, min max instead of max min. Uh, you are looking at the smallest possible radius with which you can cover your set omega using only n spheres. So that's, uh, so that's the best covering problem, okay? And uh, well, uh, there is a parameter called the mesh ratio, which is associated with uh, a given discrete set of endpoints in a in a compact uh, space, 
and it's the ratio of the covering radius over the separation distance of, of the given set. And it sort of serves as a conditioning number of the, which measures the quality of this, uh, of this point distribution. It's easy to see that this always has to be greater than uh, at least one half, because if the covering radius is less than one half times the separation, then if you take two points that are closest to each other, you will not cover the midpoint here, because the covering radius. So it will not be less than one half. Okay, uh, but um, you can also show that there exist best packings such that uh, the mesh ratio is less than less than one, less than or equal to one. Okay. But you, it's not true in general that the mesh ratio, even for best packings, that it will be bounded. Actually, a good example of that is if you take the Cantor set, if omega is the Cantor set. You can find sets of um, the 2K plus one points so that the separation is three to the negative K, and this is optimal. Okay, but the covering radius will be one third. And so the uh, mesh ratio will, will go to infinity. Okay. So, so it doesn't have to stay bounded even for best packing. So, because this, uh, the, these guys here are best packings. Again, the proof here is not uh, is not very hard. Um, well, you just take the the proof of this fact or the proof of this fact. You just take take among all the best packings. You take the one where the minimal distance occur occurs the least number of times. And then, and then it's not not hard to prove this fact. Okay. Um, also, uh, it can happen that, as I, as the example with the Cantor set shows, it can happen that uh, the best packing has a mesh ratio greater than one. Okay. It could be even very large. But interestingly, this happens if and only if. Um, the best separation distance is the same for n and n plus one points. This is an interesting phenomenon. So this means that adding one point does not uh, create smaller separation distance. Okay. And there are some examples we will see a little bit later and just uh, in just a few minutes, we will see some examples of when that happens, that uh, add in one point doesn't change anything. So there are some very common examples. Okay. Um, all right, so very often, instead of talking about the separation distance and the covering radius for a fixed number of points, you wanna go in the opposite direction. You start with a certain epsilon, so you want to cover your space with balls of radius epsilon, or you want to pack, or you want to find a sep epsilon separated set in your uh, in your space. Okay, so then, uh, so you're asking sort of for inverse problems, you're uh, looking for the covering numbers. So that's the size of the minimal epsilon covering or the minimal epsilon net, if you want. So if in most analysis courses, when you talk about compact sets, you say there exist, um, uh, there exists finite epsilon nets. Well, this quantifies this quanti uh, quantity quantifies the compactness. And by the way, logarithm of this quantity is often referred to as the uh, metric entropy. In particular, in approximation theory, this is, this term is often used. Okay, and uh, m of uh, here m of epsilon the size of the maximal epsilon separated set. Okay, so similarly. Um, Okay, and they are these inequalities that I've written down here. They are, they show that uh, these two quantities are very closely related to each other. I will leave this as an exercise. 
I think any book on analysis and approximation theory which introduces this quantity as this is probably exercise number one. Okay. It's a, it's a very simple, very useful exercise. Okay. Um, well, in these terms, um, in particular for this sphere, for one particular value of epsilon, these numbers are very well known and have a special name. So for in particular, if you take epsilon equal to one, this is known as the Kissin number. So you're looking for the maximal possible one separated set on the sphere of radius uh, one. Well, uh, if you wanted to look in terms uh, to look for it in terms of the geodesic distance or the angular distance, it would be pi over three or 60 degrees. So and this is known as a Kissin number. And again, probably almost everybody in the audience knows this. Um, it's uh, the question asks how many balls of the same radius can you have touching a given ball so that they do not overlap, so that they only touch. Okay. And the term comes from billiards because uh, when the billiard balls touch each other, people billiard players say that they kiss. Okay, so in two dimensions, um, in two M, M band dimension for S1, the answer is obvious, the answer is six. Okay, uh, for three dimensions, this is a very famous legend about uh, an argument that Newton had with Gregory, where Newton said that it's 12, and Gregory said that it's 13. Neither of them had a proof, uh, and uh, well, History showed that Newton was right, so the answer is 12. So it was uh, proved only in the middle of the 20th century by Schutte and van den Verden. Uh, okay, and then the answers are known in uh, four, eight, and 24 dimensions. Okay, and uh, uh, in four dimensions, uh, uh, it's due to Musin, and eight and 24 independently due to at least Kahn Sloan and Levenstein. So, but, but I, I will not stop much on case and numbers, but I just want to stress that this is an example of a best packing problem also. All right. So, well, I have just a few minutes left. Uh, uh, I will talk about some examples. For now, let's return to the sphere and some examples will be on general spheres, as D and D dimensions, and some further examples will be just on S2. When the answer about the optimal backings on the sphere are known. Okay. Well, in particular, if the number of points is small relative to the dimension, if it's less than the M band dimension plus one, so D plus two in this case, then the optimal packing, the best packing is given by the simplex. And here this, for the proof of this fact, one of the proofs at least, uh, the universality of simplices as energy minimizers is very useful because we know that for all S, simplices minimize Reese energies. Okay. Well, and Reese energies, uh, minimal Reese energies, in the limits give you the best packing. Okay, so that essentially gives you uh, the answer, gives you this result. And with just a little bit more effort, you can show that nothing else but the simplex can, can, be, uh, can give you best packing. So this, this answers the uh, question about the um, best packing for, well, on S2, this is for up to four points. All right, then if you take five points, okay, and this was actually, I think this was proved by Thames, the uh, minimizers are characterized by the following. You have a bipyramid where you have two opposite poles, okay, and then you have three more points on the equator which are located in any way so that the consecutive angular distances are at least pi over two. And it's easy to see that in this case, you get square root of two okay, um, as the separation distance. And it's also not hard to prove that if you take 
any set of five, five points whose separation distance is at least square root of two, it must contain two um, diametrically opposite points, two opposite poles. Okay? And in that case, the other points also have to lie in the, on the equator, of course. All right, so, so this, uh, solve, uh, this solves the case n equal to five. Okay, and the case n equal to six, okay, the answer is what you would think it should be. This is the octahedron. Okay, so basically you take all the possible plus minus elements of the orthonormal basis. And here you can see this is an example of a case when the optimal separation distance does not change when you increase the number of points. It's square root of two in both cases. Okay. Um, also, uh, well, okay, yeah, never mind. Uh, so let me just state in the last, so I started five minutes, I still have about five minutes, right? Okay, okay I will state one uh, interesting bound that due to Feyer's thought. Uh, okay, and here let's fix the number of points n. Okay, and let's take this angle, theta n. Okay, then for any set with, I think it should be at least four points actually. Yeah, for any set with at least four points on the sphere, you have this upper bound on the separation distance. Okay. Sorry? 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, the proof is a little technical. Uh, so I will just tell you a few words about the idea of the proof. So the way the proof works is that you take, uh, you take this configuration Zn and you take a tangent plane at each point Zn, tangent to the sphere, and this creates a polytope okay, uh, circumscribed around the sphere. Okay, and then um, uh, you, you sort of look at the projection of the, of the Varanoi cells or the projection of the facets of this polytope onto the sphere, and uh, they give you, uh, essentially give you the Varanoi cells of these points. But uh, the important part here, I will try to explain why this denominator here comes up. The denominator comes up from the following fact. If you have a convex polytope, which has N faces, and k edges. Then um, k is going to be less than or equal than three times n minus two. This is a standard exercise. Um, this follows from Euler's formula. And this three and minus two actually comes up here. Okay. And the proof is much more involved. It uses uh, a lot of uh, uh, spherical trigonometry. Actually, Feyerstadt thought was very good at using spherical trigonometry. He's, uh, he's, um, he did it almost like other people do planar geometry. He did it just as well. Um, just a couple interesting remarks about uh, about this bound here. So when you take um, two specific cases, n equal to four, okay, this bound is sharp. This is what you get for the simplex. Okay, and when you take n equal to 12, in this case, this angle becomes pi over five and this is what you get for the icosahedron. So in particular, this bound, well, we already had a proof about for the simplex through energies, but this bound gives you a different proof about the simplex. And this bound gives you a proof that icosahedron gives you the best packing for uh, 12 points. 
there are other ways to prove um, uh, to prove that uh, icosahedron is the best pack, and in particular through universal optimality, which I will also uh, talk about later in, the, in these lectures. But this uh, this is a nice application of uh, of phase dots. Um, so, um, oh, by the way, going back to the uh, to the octahedron or the cross polytope, as it's sometimes uh, called in higher dimensions. It's actually quite easy to understand what's, what the best covering is. So if you look at any point on the sphere, that means that x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared is is one, and that means by pigeonhole principle that for some i absolute value of x i is greater than uh, oops, sorry. greater than uh, one over the square root of three, right? and that means that it lies that x lies in the corresponding spherical cap of around either the basis vector EI or minus that that's basis vector. So you would get the covering radius is going to be two minus two over square root of three. Square root of three is going to be the cosine of the, of the angle. So this is the covering radius for um, six points. Okay, and that actually also turns out to be optimal. Right. Okay, and just to summarize, so what's known about, well, to summarize and to introduce some of the, um, um, uh, some further and later results about optimal packings on the sphere. So these are the only values of n for which best packings are known. Uh, one interesting thing here, for example, for eight points, it's not the cube. So it's the anti-prism. So in principle, well, it's the twisted cube. You take you take two um, two squares, two opposite squares, and you twist one of them by forty-five degrees. So that's and that gives uh, uh, that gives the best packing uh, of eight points on S two. Okay. Um, for n equal to 24, so that's the largest value for which it is known, it's the semi-regular uh, polyhedron. So here you have the unwrapping of this polyhedron. This resulted due, due to Robin, uh, Robinson, I think, back in the 60s. Um, in higher dimensions, there are some uh, best packings that are known in particular if n is relatively small with respect to the dimension. So, well, when n hits 2d plus 2, you get the cross polytope. So that's twice the m band dimension. So the analog is the cross polytope. There is a characterization uh, if you take n between 2d plus 2 and d plus 3. Up to d plus 2, we know it's the simplex. But from uh, for uh, this range, you have a certain characterization through, well, optimal best best packings have to uh, decompose into um, into different uh, orthogonal subspaces, into components that live in orthogonal subspaces. Okay, I don't want to uh, state the whole result. And there is just very few other best packings known. All of as far as I remember, all of them, or maybe not all of them, but most of them, at least most of them come from universally optimal sets. Um, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow. tomorrow.